I think for humanitarian organizations to really develop their people for this profound work, there have to be a huge cultural shift. We have to recognize that leadership is uh, an activity, a capacity you develop, and that that capacity would have to be distributed throughout the organization. That's an, that's an enormous undertaking. Right now, you see, it's the idea that if we promote someone to a position, then he or she becomes a leader. No. If we think of leadership as an activity that is available to anyone and we want to develop that throughout the whole organization, well then, what are the implications? Well, that's a, that's a leadership, and it's an adaptive challenge right there, because it does mean reprioritizing everything. I'm Hugh O'Doherty. I teach leadership at the John F. Kennedy School of Government. I've done that for since 2000. Originally from Northern Ireland, where I grew up in the midst of conflict, which sort of launched me into this field of leadership. I think adaptive leadership can be useful to humanitarians in the field. I would suggest there are three essential capacities that are required for the exercise of leadership. One is the capacity for observation, and that operates on you know, at least two levels. I like to use the metaphor of a dance floor on the balcony. You know, we're, like you're, when you're out there in the field and you, you're, in, you're on the dance floor and it's, it's loud and it's wild and music's playing and, you, and it's, you're swept away. And so it's very hard to be aware of the dance itself, to be aware of the system you're in as a whole. And it's very challenging to be aware of, well, what are my steps in this dance? To develop the capacity, internal capacity to, in a sense, get off the dance floor onto the balcony so you can observe both the dance, both the system and your own self and how you're being played in any moment in that system. Profoundly important capacity to develop. The second capacity is what you call uh, for, for interpretation. There is no ultimate truth. There's all the stories and interpretations that people have about reality and about what's wrong and why a problem exists. And so you have to have this capacity to develop, um, create what we call like a holding environment or a container that will hold multiple points of view. You don't agree with all of them and they'll conflict, but they're all legitimate in the sense that people believe it's the truth. And to remember your always dealing with interpretation. You're never dealing with objective truth. The third capacity, and this, this is one that's, in my experience, is rarely thought about enough in the field, which we call intervention. Most of the time when people intervene, when I mean intervene, I mean they act for some sort of change in the system because they're upset with what's happening, it's not working, they want to see something different. But what they're mobilized on, what's moving them is feeling. It's emotion. Like in Northern Ireland, people got angry or got enraged or felt humiliated and shamed and out of those emotions then they act or, or they're passionate about some issue. Now, obviously that's what moves us as human beings, but passion, for example, by itself is not a good guide to action. A central premise, a central challenge of leadership is how do you connect people through all their emotions, through all the passion, through all the rage, whatever they're feeling, to a sense of purpose. So that when they intervene, when they, when they, when they act into the community or do, do something to promote change, it's purposeful. Because it's easy to mobilize people on passion. We've seen this in the Middle East, you know, the Arab Spring. I saw it in my own country, in Northern Ireland. We were, we were, we were mobilized on tremendous passion. But that doesn't, that's not going to provide a new future um, by itself. So I'd say those three, and um, essentially the, that the capacity to intervene becomes really a very artful process. It becomes a, a craft, you know, where on the basis of this capacity to observe, to get on the balcony, see what's happening, what are the multiple points of view, and on the basis of that, then you carefully craft, how can I act or say, what will I, say here that might begin to move the people towards, uh, connect them to purpose. I think some of the small ways that humanitarians 
in the field, you know, with or without authority, might begin to incorporate this some of these aspects of adaptive leadership um, are a number of things. The first thing I'd say is don't be cons- don't, don't be too hung up on the grand plan. Adaptive problems are messy, and in fact, you know, we're we're learning on as we go, both what the nature of the problem is and what we can do. It's, we can't make it up in advance. Don't be attached to too much to a plan. I'm not saying planning isn't important. Those who own the problem are the ones who need to define and resolve it. It's not the work of the authority figure. Responsibility shifts. Technical problem, you know, the good management can handle that exercise of authority. Adaptive problem, it has to be done in partnership with, between authority and stakeholders. If you're, not, if you're locked on the plan and it's not going to as, as, you, as it ought to, you're going to be carried away with your own frustration, and that will have tremendous, you know, repercussions for how you interact with the, the organization or the community. Second thing I'd say is that because this work is messy, you need what uh, Edward Friedman, a, a psychiatrist who wrote a book called, I think it was Leadership in Times of Anxiety, it may not be the right title, but he says maybe the most important characteristic any of his needs for the exercise of leadership is what he refers to as a non-anxious presence. In other words, someone has to be able to sort of hold steady and not be swept away in all the emotion. It's actually a discipline you learn, and I still struggle with this after many years, to develop that capacity in the midst of tremendous uh, fiery you know, confrontation and people deep, deep sense of what's at stake and to be fine with that, that that's exactly, that's okay. It's, it's how it is. Leadership is a dangerous undertaking. It's not this glorified thing. You know, getting in front of a community organization with people who have deeply differing definitions of why life is the way it is, perhaps blaming each other for violence, where their values are at stake, where they're afraid they're going to lose. There's nothing glorious about getting in front of that. No one's going to applaud you because particularly when, as I've said, the work is giving the work back. If I've learned one thing in my life over the last 30, 35 years, it's a fundamental principle. People only take responsibility for what they help create. People only take responsibility for what they help create. Engaging with people so that they will take that responsibility when they want you to fix it. That's why we gave you the authority. You're disappointing what they want from you. And they're not going to initially, until they recognize that, that they, they're not going to be happy with you. And so one of the classic ways that people avoid adaptive work is they blame authority. You got Obama in, didn't fix the problem, made the wrong choice. Let's put in Trump. What can he do? Only disappoint also. And we need a new one. And all you have is a, like a fight for the throne, for the authority role. Of course, the, the second way that people avoid adaptive work is you make the adaptive problem technical. You know, we build a wall in Belfast to keep Protestant and Catholic apart rather than figuring out what, what, what would be required to build trust here. Because 80% of people on both sides say, we'd like the walls to come down. But 80% on both sides say, but we don't trust the others. Why not? And what types of interventions are required to have both communities, not the authorities people, but both communities own that problem, take responsibility for it. And, and until that happens, then you're walking a very dangerous tightrope, you know, in terms of this issue of disappointing expectations. I always look to Nelson Mandela. I mean, he's one of the great figures, and people pick, you know, choose him all the time. But there was the understandable desire on the part of the South Africans to abolish the rugby team, to abolish the Springboks, because the Springboks, you know, symbolized everything about white oppression. And it's sort of obvious, they just like just abolish it right away. He understood. But if we do that, that's 
that's uh, something they hold precious and that we only alienate them. They create resentment. And if in the future, South Africa, we need to be allies. And so that to me is, is, is very, you know, on a global scale, very, it's a wonderful example of, which is a very challenging aspect of leadership is how do you figure out what's precious? What do you need to hold on to in your culture and values that's brought us here? But what might we have to give up in order to allow some new future? Because if we can't do that, there's nothing new going to emerge. And he, he demonstrated that in the most powerful way, I think. People watching the video, what I'd most like them to get out of it, I would say that to give up wanting to be a leader, to absolutely connect to whatever their own deep sense of purpose is, particularly in this humanitarian world, connect deeply with that, and then develop the capacity for the activity of leadership, for this capacity to you know, mobilize multiple stakeholders, to know how to create a holding environment that will hold them through this fiery place where they conflict, to understand how to give the work back, to, not, to, to separate self and role, so when people are, are dissatisfied that you're giving the work back, you don't take it personally, but you realize, no, this is the resisting loss. It's not, it's not about me. And to always stand in purpose, to really create the conditions where you find with your colleagues that you, you always reconnect with the purpose because you'll be swept away moment to moment, you're swept away into the desire to fix it technically, to blame someone, particularly authority figures, but come back and, and stand clearly and uh, keep igniting, keep stoking that flame of purpose. I'd say that would be my uh, biggest encouragement.